Judging from uh, what I've heard in the classroom and talking to students um, and looking at some of the work that people have turned in, it looks like I need to go back over the difference between some of these biomes. Um, and we need to start off with the difference between freshwater and saltwater. And it's really fairly easy. I mean, saltwater has salt in it. Freshwater has very little salt in it. Water with little to no salt. I mean, if you say that freshwater has no salt, I'm not going to correct you. Um, but do understand that it does have some trace elements of other minerals and salt in it. Um, but we need to talk about the difference. Now, I think everyone understands the marine biome um, is aquatic because it has to do with water and they understand that it has salt water but we started to get a little confused with some of these other biomes so i'm going to go over them one more time and we're going to start off with lakes and ponds lakes and ponds if if we were to and we're supposed to do this in all of our um, google docs that we're creating about each individual ecosystem lakes and ponds are freshwater aquatic ecosystems, which means they have to do with water and the type of water there is freshwater, little to no salt. We also have to talk about the other abiotic factors. So we've already talked about water, freshwater. What about sunlight? I mean, let's be honest, where are we? What time, what time of year is it? Um, we could be at a lake uh, in North Carolina and be out there in the summertime skiing and, and having a good time on the lake because it's hot and then go back out in the middle of December and we could freeze to death. So the sunlight and the temperature varies. And again, I keep using that word, but that word pops up a lot of time. It varies means it changes. And our sunlight, the intensity of it changes as the seasons go by. And the temperature or the climate changes as the seasons go by. Uh, what about the soil? Again, that's going to vary as well. Some lakes and ponds have like muddy bottoms. Some of them have sandy bottoms. Some of them have rocky bottoms. And it just depends on which one you're at. So when you're trying to list that, you can't talk about all of those. You, you would spend like days on days. Just understand that when we're talking about lakes and ponds, they're very different than say a desert. In a desert, it's extremely intense sunlight. It's very hot. There's little to no rain. It's the abiotic factors that set it apart. With a lake and a pond, one abiotic factor that sets it apart is it's fresh water, but then it's the um, biotic factors that really make lakes and ponds and other freshwater systems unique. Um, to uh, live in a freshwater area, to live in that freshwater area, you need to be adapted to freshwater. And like I have up here, there's no whales, there's no clownfish. Uh, you're not going to find sharks in a lake or a pond. However, you might find insects. You will find certain types of fish, bass. You might find crappie, catfish would be there. You might find all sorts of reptiles. You could find beavers, ducks, birds that would live, um, not obviously, you know, underwater, but at the, at the freshwater source. You'd find frogs. You can certainly hear them chirping throughout the night. Some of the plants that we might find. Obviously, algae is very important in the ocean. It's just as important in lakes and ponds. Cattails, and we've talked about those cattails before. You find them at fresh water. You might find water lilies. You know, like the lily pads that you see frogs sitting on in pictures, you might find water lilies. So lakes and ponds have more interesting biotic factors, and their number one abiotic factor is the fact that they are fresh water. Rivers and streams, to me, are extremely similar to lakes and ponds, and the fact that the number one abiotic factor that sets them apart is the fresh water. Your sunlight, your climate, or your temperature, and your soil are all going to vary. There's that word again. They're going to change depending on where you are and what time of season it is. But what doesn't change between those two is that rivers and streams, lakes and ponds have fresh water. Now, our biotic factors might change up a little bit. In a lake and a pond, you might find bass and things like that, but in rivers, you might find trout. You will find other fish. You could find some bass in rivers and streams. You could find some crappie there, but they prefer to be in more still water. Trout, however, enjoy the rapids that you might find in rivers and streams. You're still going to find reptiles. River otters, 
Now, I have seen otters that live near a lake, but they were also close to a river and stream, and I've seen river otters on rivers. So they may live in both, but they've adapted to that fresh water. Again, turtles, you may find them in a river and a stream, you may find them in a pond. So they have some similar things, but they have some things that set them apart. And one thing that really sets them apart is ferns. Ferns, you find them growing very often along the banks of rivers and streams. Um, and I've actually seen that question pop up on a test before. Um, so that's why uh, when we, we go to the next slide or two here, we talk about ferns for a little bit because I want people to know what I'm talking about when we talk about right here, ferns. I want people to see it and understand that. Again, you're not going to find an octopus. You're not going to find jellyfish in a river and a stream. You're going to find freshwater adapted animals. Let you watch that at home. Ferns. This is a fern, and you can see right here they're growing along. A river and a stream. Do you need to know a fern is a member of a vascular plant? No. There you go. Here's your notes for ferns. You might often find them along the river of a bank, or along your river bank, sorry, because that's where they grow. They need to have an ample supply of water, and what a great place to have it is near um, a river bank. And I think that's extremely important. You can watch this video on ferns. It's pretty awesome. Bill and I video for you. Swamps. Now, I know we talked about this, I think, fairly quickly in the last video, but swamps. Here we go. Listen, this is this here. Most, not all, most of the plant life in a swamp are trees. Most of the plant life in a swamp are trees. And you might see some cypress swamps or cypress trees in, in the areas. Um, they look kind of like this here. Um, southern swamps, like you might find in Florida. But again, most of the plant life in a swamp are trees. Now, does that mean that trees, if, you, if I just say trees, I'm thinking swamps? No, because that could be a deciduous forest. That could be a taiga. That could be a rainforest. But when I say that most of the plant life in this area is trees, it's fresh water. Some of the biotic factors in here are gators, birds like a heron, mosquitoes, then all of a sudden I start thinking, okay, that's starting to narrow out some of those other places and, and it's really starting to focus more in on swamps, more in on swamps. And again, they are fresh water. They are fresh water. I'm not saying you could reach a cup down in there and drink that water, um, but it is going to be water with little to no salt. It's going to have lots of other stuff in it, mud and dirt and everything else. You would definitely want to filter that before you drink it, but it's still fresh water. Now, this fact right here is extremely important. Most of the plant life in a swamp is trees, okay? Because we're going to say something like opposite of that in just a moment. Many animals in the swamp uh, employ camouflage as an adaptation to protect themselves. I, I know you probably can see this frog. Maybe you missed him and just thought, why does Mr. Bullens have a bunch of green looking stuff? Um, and it's important to have camouflage. You wouldn't want to run around and, and be able for all the predators to see you. So one other, not only is to live in fresh water, you also need to have camouflage is another uh, adaptation that they may have. A lot of videos on swamps, apparently. A marsh. A marsh. Now, just a moment ago, we said the main plant life in a swamp is trees. The main plant life in a marsh are grasses. Um, I'm fairly certain you're going to see a question about that um, because it's important to understand the difference between the two. Freshwater marshes, they just happen to form on top of saturated soil, like the, the ground starts to get wet, like super wet, and it can't hold any more water. Water forms on top of it, and you have a marsh. Again, here we go. Most of the plant life in a marsh is grass. Look around. Do I see some trees? Absolutely. Are there grasses in the swamps? Sure. In that picture of the swamp, I saw mostly trees. Here, I see, again, most of the plant life are grasses. Again, raccoons, beavers, birds, ducks. Webbed feet is an adaptation that helps people in freshwater marshes so they can swim and move around. Some of them have very special beaks that help them hunt so they can get deep into that grass and pull things out. But your sunlight, your soil, and your temperatures, again, they vary in a marsh. Depending on what time of year it is and where you are located. If we're in the swamps, 
or a marsh down in Florida, it's going to be warm most of the time. If you're in a swamp or a marsh in North Carolina, what month is it? If it's January, it's cold. If it's July, it's sweltering hot out there. It just depends. They can vary. So again, when we start talking about marshes, I'm thinking grasses. When I start talking about swamps, I'm thinking trees. But there's two types of marshes, freshwater marsh and a saltwater marsh. Boy, oh boy, you really shouldn't miss those two because one has fresh water and one has salt water. We've seen this. This is very, very similar to our estuaries. This is where salt water moves in during the high tides. And there's a place just like this at Oak Island. Some of you might know about that. Again, very similar to estuary. Do the very levels of salts do the tides. Okay. Ducks, birds, crabs live here. Again, climates can vary, sunlight can vary, but your water in a saltwater marsh is salty. Again, look around. A majority of the plants in a saltwater marsh are grasses. Grasses, except these grasses have adapted to getting rid of the salt or being able to adapt to live in like fluctuating salt levels. So there's marshes. This is an osprey. Mr. Bowen, why in the world would you teach us about some random bird? Well, because I have seen the word osprey pop up on, on end of grade tests. I've seen it pop up on benchmarks. I've seen it pop up in tests. And I feel bad when a word like that comes up because it's like they just expect kids to know what an osprey is. If they said an eagle, everyone would be fine. But no, they throw osprey out there. An osprey is a bird. It's very similar to an eagle. It lives near water sources like marshes or swamps because its main source of food is fish, as you can see here. If you happen to see something about an osprey, then you know it is a bird that lives near a water source and its main source of food is fish. Bog. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on bogs. Um, they're, they show up every once in a while, but if someone, if it happens to be an answer in a test, I want you to know what it is so you know that's probably not the right answer. Bogs have horrible soil, and they have a high peat content. And again, what is peat? Well, peat is down here, a brown soil-like material characteristic of boggy, acidic ground consisting of partly decomposed vegetable matter. So imagine that this right here is a giant, thick stew of decomposing, mostly broken down, smushy plants. Imagine like your mom or dad left celery out and they left it out for like weeks and it just got rotten and smushy almost to the point where it was like just all like liquidy. That's what a bog is. Terrible soil. So if we start talking to a place that has terrible soil and high peat content, but it's got some water there, we're going to go with a bog but we're probably not going to see anything about a bog. If you notice, I don't have any more arrows over here. We have now ended our aquatic biomes. Now we get to step into what I think is like, like a lot of fun. I enjoy the ocean. I enjoy the freshwater versus saltwater. But man, oh man, when we start talking about the specific uh, terrestrial biomes, we really get into a lot of the fun biomes where like the not only the abiotic factors make a difference it's the biotic factors that make a huge difference um we've practiced that in class before where we can start listing off different factors and you can pretty much tell me where i am and that's our goal in all of this is to be able to identify the biotic and abiotic factors in different areas that make each biome unique so we've left off here what's our job to do now obviously other than bog we're going to open up a google doc at some point, and we're going to write about marshes. You can put salt water and fresh water on the same page. That's fine. We're going to do a page, uh, one Google Doc on swamps. Shouldn't take you too long. Should be a lot of stuff in there about gators and what? Trees, especially these cypress trees. We're going to do a Google Doc about rivers and streams. What should be in rivers and streams, I would imagine ferns shows up. And then lastly, if you haven't already done it, we're going to do a Google Doc on lakes and ponds. Um, the same thing that we've been doing. Just write a Google Doc. Tell me about what makes them very special. What abiotic factors, and some of them vary. You can just put that in there. And then what biotic factors make them uh, unique. All right, that's it, kids. Smash that like button. Don't forget to subscribe.